Hello everyone, this is John from AU Pack Meal, and today we're going to talk Game of Thrones Season 8 with a great creator, Robert from In Deep Geek, also The Well Told Tale, and um, he's just a great creator. I'm really happy to have him on. Um, I think he's probably got the smoothest voice in all of YouTube, and I really do appreciate you taking the time. You're super generous for coming on this uh that old man from Seattle's uh, YouTube channel. <laughs> so thank you very much, Robert, for coming on. Would you like to say hello to everybody? Uh, well, the honor is all mine, AU, and uh, the smoothest voice on YouTube, I think, is uh, a very kind, but a gross exaggeration. I'm going to have to have a drink another bit more tea just to make it extra smooth for you. I've embarrassed Robert. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it's a pleasure and a delight. You, you've been on my channel before. Um, we, we did a little bit of stuff on Westworld together, uh, and it's fantastic to repay the favor just to come over here and uh, and just chat about Game of Thrones. So I'm really looking forward to it. If you don't know me, by the way, I should probably have introduced myself. Is there anybody who doesn't know me? My channel, my two channels, uh, the first one is called In Deep Geek, where I uh, look at Game of Thrones, Westworld, probably a couple of other things. I looking to get a bit more into Tolkien after Game of Thrones season eight. Um, and I just try and uh, analyze them and critique them and try and get beneath the obvious to, uh, to to try and extract whatever insights we can. And then my second channel is called The Well Told Tale. That is me doing audio narration. I just read what I consider to be the finest science fiction and fantasy stories ever written. Uh, so we're going through and doing things um, like Frankenstein and the War of the Worlds, um, uh, a little bit of H.P. Lovecraft, stuff like that. Well, I don't know if you guys don't know Robert, but if you don't, I don't know what the hell's wrong with you. All of the, all of the information about Robert's channel, Robert's second channel, Robert's Patreon, everything about Robert, including his date of birth, social security number, et cetera, is in the description below. So go check that out. Make sure you... Uh, say hello to him later on in some of his videos. By the way, you have a, a huge collection of videos. I looked at, at the uh, um, number earlier, 300 and almost 50, if I remember correctly. So wow. you're a huge creator there. Um, you've narrated so many books in The Well-Told Tale. That's a super fantastic idea, by the way. I really enjoy that. Thank you. Yeah, it's the, the the number of videos it kind of creeps up on you because like, I do um, two, three, four a week sometimes, and and you don't really think about it when you're doing that. You just think, oh, I'll do another video in a couple of days' time. <laughs> but I've been doing this for over two years now, so uh, yeah, it's it, it starts to creep up, which is yeah. good. And it's it's especially nice when you do a video um, that you're quite pleased about, and then you forget about it until like a year later, and then suddenly a comment appears on it from someone who just randomly stumbled across it, and it's just, oh, great, that's still that's still providing value. It's, uh, it's a really nice thing. Yeah, it's, uh, um, it's a great accumulation of uh, material, that's for sure. Um, in regards to your creation, um, one of the things that I really like is your traveler's guide. Um, you have created a, basically where you feel like you're literally carrying your walking stick, um, your Frodo or Bilbo in one of those tails, and you just go up to the door and knock on the door and, and enter. And, and basically, I get the feeling that I'm really there. So uh, I really do appreciate that creation. Well, that, that was the intention with that. For, uh, for, for those who haven't come across them, it's just a series of videos going all the way around Westeros, and we're, we're going to move across to Essos as well afterwards, and just spending a little bit of time looking at different places. But the idea is not just to do a sort of a, a normal history of this is what happened here, but actually to treat it more like a travel guide. So we're trying to get you immersed in it. What does, what can you see? What can you smell? How hot is it? What's the, uh, what's the feeling, the ambience? Is it noisy? All of this kind of stuff. And actually to try and get an understanding of what a place is like, because the vibe in, um, uh, King's Landing is very different if you're a flea bottom to if you're in the Red Keep. And, and I just wanted to try and uh, get that different ambience and try and uh, put it across to people. Yeah, I really um, think that you've done an excellent job with that. And I um, have appreciated the fact that it doesn't have to be a, a theory video to enjoy it as much as um, some of the ones that you have done. 
Um, and I, I think that's a great part of the story is that it's so deep, it's tangible, it's palpable. And uh, you have made it that way. So thank you for contributing there. In regards to that, can you tell me uh, what what is it that you see from your tales that are leading us towards season eight? If you could pick a certain area, maybe uh, Winterfell or, or one of the other uh, places in the north, or maybe it's not even related to that, that kind of give us a hint as to what's going on in uh, season eight. Yeah, I think, uh, well, let's take the north, for example. What I found when I was doing the videos was that it made me start to look at the culture of places a whole lot more than just the sort of the dry history of who was a king when and, and all the rest of it. And in the north, I think the thing which uh, really struck me at Winterfell was not so much the stuff we know about Winterfell. We've seen it lots. We, we, we've read about it lots. It's just outside Winterfell where you get Wintertown. Now, in the trailer, there was like a little shot of that, actually, when you saw uh, Daenerys' army, the Unsullied, just marching through this town on their way to Winterfell. That was Wintertown. And that is a town outside of Winterfell. It has 15, 20,000 people in it, in theory. Uh, in practice, during most of the year, it's almost empty. It's a ghost town. But then when the winter comes, then all of the farmers, all of the settlers, the crofters, the, the people in the towns and villages around Winterfell, they all descend down and turn that into its own town just outside Winterfell because obviously they've got the hot springs and things like that so the chances of survival are much higher if you're based there and I would love to see season eight to them make use of that I, I hope that they will because of what we saw in the trailer but this idea that Winterfell is not just a castle out there that um, that, that can be attacked but actually you have to worry about the fact that you've got this completely unprotected civilian population just outside your walls, thousands and thousands of people. What are you going to do about that? That's the kind of thing that I'd love to see in some extra kind of layers of detail. Yeah, because they could be turned against you, you know, with the Night King killing them, right? Oh, yeah, exactly. So so if if the, the White Walkers suddenly launched a surprise attack, massacred their way through Wintertown, suddenly they've got a huge army of whites you know, to add to the army of whites that they've already got. So yeah, you need to do something with those people. Winterfell as a castle is big, but it's not big enough to house all of those people. So they've actually got a problem. Absolutely. Uh, one of the things that uh, I wonder, uh, and I really haven't gotten any favoritism from the videos, is which area would you go to? Uh, um, well, I'm glad you haven't had any favoritism. I think the, the only thing was a little running gag with myself about a Dornish red and a glass of Dornish red. Um, uh, but apart from that, no, personally, I, I love Bravos. I've not got there yet. I'll probably get there in a few weeks, actually, in the Traveler's Guide. Uh, but Bravos it reminds me of Venice very much, which is one of my favourite cities in the entire world. It's majestic and otherworldly. And Bravos, as well as looking great, is an incredibly detailed city. George R. R. Martin has drawn it out. There's lots of things that we know about, like the Iron Bank and the Faceless Men and things like that. But there's also a huge layer of complicated politics going on that we just scratching the surface of. And there's a lot of backstory that we don't know all of the details about yet as well. So in, in the books, we'll hear a lot more about what's going on in Bravos, I feel sure. But just in terms of uh, wandering around the streets and, and investigating, that would be the place I'd love to go the most. Nice. Great questions from uh, the chat as well. And so we'll get to those in just a moment. But um, in regards to the location, is there a, a place that you think is safe in season eight? Um, safe? Not really. Somewhere... Somewhere in Essos, I, th I think if they're if that they will focus on Westeros, they will focus on the places that we already know because this is how they're going to build up the tension. So they're going to focus in 
perhaps a little bit on Castle Black, which wasn't hit when they went through the wall. Um, Winterfell, definitely, and King's Landing, definitely. Those are the things that they're going to focus on. So if you're not in one of those areas, then you're probably safe. Dawn is probably a pretty good shot. But if you're trying to hide from the White Walkers, it's somewhere across some big ocean or the um, uh, somewhere like Starfall off in Dawn, an island uh, in Dawn, that would work quite well, I would have thought. Yeah, I think that's a probably the most uh, specific place that I would consider going to, if not Hightower. Um, or or the, the, the other thing is the Eyrie, of course, because that is, um, you know, we're talking about the Traveler's Guide. It, it, I did one of the Traveler's Guides literally just traveling up to try to get to the Eyrie, and it is scarily defensible, um, unless you've got a massive undead dragon, you know, <laughs> then it's qu it's quite hard to to get anywhere near it, um, and they can they can keep themselves well provisioned for a long period of time. Obviously, you're cut off from everywhere else, but if you're just wanting to sit somewhere and be defended, then that's as good as you're going to get. Yeah, I think um, I think the the season seven finale was kind of telling in regards to what nobody is safe right from the dragon. No, exactly. And that's that I think was necessary because if you if you introduce the baddies and say, well, they are entirely um, able to be mown down with just dragon fire from above, um, then it doesn't make it an even battle. Now, something in the back of your mind's going, huh, so there's one dragon on that side and two on this side. We don't yet know all the powers of this this undead um, uh, dragon. Where, where is the, the, the strength here? Um, who's the favorite at the moment? And you probably have to say the Night King and the Army of the Dead right now, based purely on what they've shown us in the show. Obviously, they'll make it look that way because it makes it more tense and all the rest of it. But the whole point about the way that the White Walkers work is that every single time a human dies, one gets taken off the tally of the, 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 the humans and one gets added to the tally of the dead. And that's, that's the way it goes. So the further they get, the more momentum they will get. And their tactics, if you look at it, slight digression, but their tactics before they got to the wall seemed to be clearing every single bit of north of the wall of any human life and then moving on south. So that seems to be the way they're going to do it, and it's entirely sensible. They're leaving nobody left alive uh, in their path. Yeah, I think the fact that they can resurrect people um, after they're dead is probably the biggest uh, OP stuff that uh, most any creature has ever possessed in any film. Yeah, yeah, and do it quickly and en masse as well. That was the really scary thing when they had the hard home episode and you get the Night King raising his hands and then suddenly everybody gets up. It's not just uh, takes a while and you can bring back one person. This is just almost in the middle of battle. You could suddenly raise up a whole new load of, arm, of, of soldiers. So Amanda uh, from Broken Birds asked uh, for season eight, is Dead Viserion's dragon fire hotter or more powerful than Drogon or Rhaegal's? Well, we we don't know because we don't know much about what Viserion is. There, there was an entire debate that went on in the fandom whether or not this made uh, Viserion a, a white dragon or a white walker dragon or an ice dragon or whatever. How do we categorize them? We just the simple answer is we do not know. The with the flames, they. Um, Dragon flames, although on the show they, they show them as just like flamey kind of flames, in the books, dragons have different coloured flames. Uh, they quite often seem to match their uh, the colours that, that of their scales. So Valerian the Black Dread, for example, the, the one that Aegon the Conqueror rode, that had black fire literally coming from it. And um, so uh, the fact it's got a different color, it's got this very blue, doesn't necessarily mean a temperature thing. This is a magical flame. It's not when, so we're not looking at is, uh, is blue fire hotter than red fire or anything like that. So it's, short answer is we do not know. 
And the slightly more interesting answer is we should find out because there is going to be dragon on dragon fighting in season eight. Absolutely. Yeah, I think um, everybody wants to speculate blue fl blue flame is hotter than yellow flame and that sort of thing. And uh, there is a, a you know like you said a debate in the fandom of which is hotter. Um, I would assume the bigger dragons are going to be blowing hotter flame. But then again, this is a, a, um, a being that is resourced by the Night King, so we don't really know his power, correct? We, we don't, and, and the, the, the point about Drogon is that Drogon always was the biggest, the strongest, and the most powerful. And that is at least partly, not entirely, because he was always bigger, but at least partly due to the fact that the other two dragons were locked up for a while and so they didn't get a chance to get out and feed and hunt and grow and stretch their wings and all the rest of it. So Drogon could go out and grew and developed while they were slightly more stunted in their growth. So on the base level, we would have to say Drogon is probably still more powerful. But as you say, it really depends on what exactly Viserion is. Is it just the equivalent of uh, the way that the, the Night King seemed to reanimate humans or polar bears or whatever, in which case they seem to have pretty much what they, the powers that they had before, but if anything, not as scared because they were being totally uh, controlled and therefore more willing to go all out, almost berserker in battle. We've seen an awful lot of uh, magical creatures, shadow cats, uh, dire wolves, um, mastiffs, and uh, so, you know, woolly mammoths rather, and then um, of course dragons. Is there a particular favorite that you have in the book or in the show? Well, I think that the thing that uh, most um, aficionados of, of the others have is that the, the legends are of them with giant ice spiders and that would just be amazing if you just just picture for one moment this um i was hoping that they would scuttle up the wall uh they did in a vision that john had in the books but just imagine on the walls of winterfell as they're trying to defend and then uh pushing off um uh, whites as they were trying to climb up the wall and then an ice giant ice spider scuttles its way all up to that. That, that would be amazing <laughs> visuals. Whether they've got the CGI budget to be doing that, I don't know. Um, I imagine that spiders are probably even more costly than dire wolves. You mentioned in regards to the dragon fire, the colors, and George uses colors a lot, even in the description of the rivers. Um, plus he has, you know, ancient stories with colors. Is, is he trying to make a point or is he trying to get you to connect the dots or where is the colors, blue, red, green, even the obsidian? Um, there has to be some sort of connection, right? Uh, there is, but it's not a kind of a dot to dot kind of thing. So we can't sort of say he said the word white here, he said the word white there, therefore those things are necessarily connected because some things just happen to be that color. Uh, but what he loves doing is playing with symbolism. And so he would, um, particularly with things like white and black, he, he loves playing with this. You get characters with black hair and a white streak. Um, uh, and uh, you, my favorite example is Blood Raven, who has got a very singular look. He's uh, you know, the, the three eyed uh, raven on the show. He's. Uh, but he's got this white skin, he's got a red eye, um, and every time uh, some somebody appears who's got the same colouring, then you know that it's somehow connected to him, whether that is uh, a woods witch who went down back in history, appeared back in history, or ghost John's uh, dire wolf who appears to, uh, the three-eyed raven, blood raven, appears to have warbled into him at various points. Um, it's all a hint that this is somehow connected to him. Um, in your research for uh, the Traveler's Guide, did you ever come across any information that caused the Starks not to have dire wolves anymore? Um, in what sense? What, that well, made it they, look like they won't get their house and they haven't been south of the wall for 200 years. 
is the is the you know book quotes uh from theon so we we know that there hasn't been dire wolves but if it's your sigil it's kind of like a dragon you want that animal in your household but we've i haven't read of anything that um substantiates why there's no dire wolves in winterfell no and uh, i mean i think this is a really interesting point the the way i've always viewed it is that actually if anything what this tells us is that the starks never treated dire wolves as something that could be locked up that could be cultivated they had to remain wild and any well what dire wolves that they had in the past the starks clearly never thought you know what let's domesticate they, these let's make them uh, a kind of a symbol of who we are let's make sure that there's always one here in in winterfell in the kennels they they that seems to have not happened they've always been able to kind of run free and roam free so at some point it would appear that the dire wolves just died out um and yeah as they say hadn't been seen south of the wall for a very very long time so th the short answer is no we're not told why we're also not told that they did always have them until a certain point and then they didn't have them it's not at all clear it just seems that there is a sort of a a, a special bond that's going on there yeah i think the fact that they're at the feet of uh the kings of winter is really telling because there's no real point that you can see where that stops uh, it's not given in the description with Lewin uh, going through and, and describing them and or Bran even when he takes uh, Mira and tells him this is my uncle, you know, and, and the lineage. Um, but there isn't a, a specific date where you can say this is the person that had the last one and we'll go from there. It wasn't like that at all. Yeah, I, I think that's right. Um, uh yeah, I was just having a quick look at through the, the chat. So uh, Mrs. Cronall saying the direwolves seem to have a relationship akin to the Targ dragon relationship in the sense that they died out. Yeah, I think that's the kind of the hint that's there, but it's a slightly different one in, in as much as the Targaryens seemed to, um, uh, they, they tried to have a one-to-one -one bond with the dragons in the same way that the Stark kids had a one-to-one -one bond with the direwolves but what the targaryens did was they did try and kennel them as it were they built the dragon pit and the starks don't seem to have done that we, we don't read about anything in winterfell of being here's the direwolf stables or anything like that that's that's just not a thing that's there yeah i, I think it's an interesting part of the story that uh we haven't really discussed as a fandom and i'm really curious as to um, you know, what you found in your research, but I, I don't think that um, it really matters, I guess, at, at this point. We do have them uh, north of the wall. Um, they're just not part of the Winterfell uh, directive, I guess is the best way to put it. Yeah, ex exactly. And and we shouldn't necessarily, and somebody, sorry, I didn't uh, spot who it was, did point out now, House Umber don't keep pet giants so it's it's not it's not the um the, it's not that just because something's your sigil you necessarily have to have it chained up somewhere that the lannisters have chained up lions somewhere sure but north they don't necessarily have to do that it's just this is the, the their spiritual embodiment of who they are that's a perfect way of putting it right the um Oh, I'm I'm blanking on the word. What is the uh, Harry Potter version? The Patronus. <laughs> it's their Patronus. <Yes>. That's right. <laughs> oh, no, we're not crossing fandoms, right? Oh, we, we can absolutely whenever you want to. Well, speaking of floor is yours, Dumbledore. <laughs> speaking of crossing fandoms, I know that you're a big Tolkien fan. I'm a huge Tolkien fan. I think George is probably the bigger of the three of us. Is uh, Tolkien fan. I, I want to know um, what you think that George will take from his story that he put in from Tolkien, not including what we already know, like the trees, obviously, and the glass candles. Is there something that, that you particularly like that he has taken and put it in the uh, story? 
Well, I can talk about something that I I hope he's put in the story, um, which is uh, a sort of a hat tip to, in the films, you remember, I think it must have been in the third film, Aragorn uh, suddenly gets this army of ghosts that the, the backstory is built up a bit more in the books, that they're the, the dead men of Dunharrow who come to, um, uh, to fight, who they've been sort of bound and they now need to sort of um, uh, show their honour. Now, I have this theory that perhaps not on the show, but in the books, definitely the dead Starks of Winterfell will rise and they will fight for the Starks. And that is why there's been this millennia old tradition of burying all the Starks in there um, and why every time people go down there, they feel as if they're being watched because the dead Starks are there, they are bound there. Um, so that's my theory, is that there's going to be a little nod to the dead, to the dead men of Dunharrow in what happens in the, the crypts of Winterfell. That would be an interesting um, happening because, as we remember in um, Return of the King, there wasn't any physical form of the, the, the army of the dead. Um, but in... Game of Thrones, we did see at the Blood Raven's tree, um, basically skeleton type uh, whites come about. Do you think they'll do the Lord of the Rings version? If that were um, to happen? What, in, in the books, you mean? Correct. Yeah, I think so. I think so. So the, the bodies who were buried thousands of years ago there's not going to be much of them anymore so we're not going to get whites uh, as such we're not going to be get the zombie type thing so i think we're going to get the spirits somehow there there is a um a sort of a a hint of this um this idea of the spirits being restless actually when uh catelyn stark just talks about she's talking about the mists at storm's end um, uh, and actually, I think Old Man would, uh, did as well about this this idea that they're the restless when the mists are rolling in. It's the restless spirits trying to return to their graves, and so the idea is there. It's been sort of peppered around that there are there are uh, restless spirits and the like. Um, so yeah, if they come back, it'll be more ghostly than um, zombie like. I think. If any of you are Tolkien fans, uh, on the twenty ninth. Angelina, hi, and I will be talking about uh, Game of Thrones and the conversion and, and uh, what George has taken from the story. So I, I think it's really interesting. Matter of fact, yesterday um, I was talking to uh, Justin and um, from Top Shell Fandom, who's a, a good friend of yours, and we were talking about the ring and the throne, kind of like the creation that uh, had to be destroyed. Do you think the throne is going to be one of those things that George uses to destroy in order to create a new world? Well, he is, but more importantly, it's what it represents. So the the thing about the One Ring is that that was there to build on people's greed. It made them hungry for, for power, for riches, for things along those lines. And the Iron Throne is the symbolism of this fight for power. And in the same way that the One Ring had to be destroyed in order for there to be a resolution to that, otherwise people would still be hankering after power and, and the ring would still be um, uh, sort of attaching itself to people. Then in the same way as that, I think in, uh, in Game of Thrones, the Iron Throne has to go because otherwise we still have this symbol and we're just going to get this, uh, it'll be a slightly different cast, but different people vying to have this ultimate power. So um, that as the symbol of conquest, and it's made from literally from the swords of, of vanquished foes, that as a symbol, I think, has to go to symbolise a new start after all of this. Because when we're talking about um the 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 wheel has to be broken when danny is saying that she's not actually saying what we might think we're hearing 
which is that this whole system has to change. Her v version of it is that the Targaryens have to get back into control and stop everyone else from getting their hands on the Iron Throne. That's what her idea of the wheel breaking is. But the wheel actually breaking means changing the system and getting rid of the symbol of that lust for power that has been sort of driving so much of this action and preventing people from seeing the real threat from the North. Yeah, so uh, in the chat, we have someone requesting the correct uh, pronunciation of aluminum. Aluminium, yeah, <laughs> of course. Because you have that, have that aluminum hat, right? To keep away. I, I, I've, I've no idea what this strange aluminum <laughs> stuff is. Uh, but uh, yeah, so we have tinfoil hats. So we, 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 don't, we don't have aluminum hats. <laughs> For those of you in the chat that don't know, this is Robert from In Deep Geek. All of his information is in the description below. And uh, I really appreciate your content. You've done a great job in telling us all about Westeros through the Traveler's Guide. Um, and I think one of the things that I really enjoy is your um, Old Town description, because that's one of the places that has a, a very old world feel as well as a new world, because we have the, you know, the maesters there. Um, was there anything that you uh, remember from Old Town that was specifically interesting, like the Sphinx or the base of the tower or something like that? Well, the whole place is fascinating. I think what um, the, the thing that I'd not noticed before was the way that the high tower itself, massively tall, is used as a sundial by the people. And so it, but it's where its shadow is in the city. This is how people know what the time is. And that symbolically is this kind of symbol of stability, this symbol of always being there, of the passing of time that kind of embodies what Old Town and um, House Hightower are all about. House Hightower are older than House Stark, not just by a little bit, but by a long way. They were there. The, the rumours that Bran the Builder built the High Tower, if that's true, the High Tower that we know was the fifth attempt at it. They'd done it, they'd built four wooden structures before and brought them back down. Like Storm's End, right? It's uh, been rebuilt yeah. and rebuilt and rebuilt. Uh, well, yes, yeah, so, but uh, the, the, and, and Bran the Builder again attached, the, the rumours are attaching him to Storm's End, so there's mm -hmm. definitely a link going on there. And incidentally, the wall, while I'm digressing, the wall, we think of it as being this massively kind. When it started, it was actually just a normal level wall. It's just successive generations have added more to it and added more to it and added more to it. So um, uh, what he built is perhaps not what we immediately uh, think of. It's, it's, it's slightly different. But House Hightower are incredibly old and they are, provide huge amounts of stability. And when you think about uh, Old Town, we... In the show, it was just like almost an afterthought. But as a uh, as a house, House Hightower are in what was the largest city until relatively recently when King's Landing overtook it. It's the richest city trading port. The Reach as a whole is the richest area. They've got the biggest army. Old Town, the High Towers have got the largest part of the biggest army. Their fleet is one of the three biggest fleets in the entire world. They have got uh, the Maesters who have got control over absolutely every, every bit of knowledge, uh, every bit of communication, every bit of learning and teaching, healing. That's all based down in Old Town and paid for, follow the money, it's paid for by House High Tower. Uh, you get the um, the Faith of the Seven. Recently, obviously, we have the Great Sept have moved over to uh, King's Landing, but the base of it, the heart of it, is still with the Starry Sept in Old Town. This, they, they are described as being as rich as the Lannisters. This is not just some kind of bit part family house that we we don't uh, we don't need to take much. Attention much attention to. House Hightower are one of the most important, richest, most powerful connected families in the entire continent. Um, so that I think was one of the other things that just uh, really struck me. They've been so silent in the story so far, but they, they have got a huge amount of power. 
Yeah, I, I, I think that's one of the things that we miss in the descriptions of, of uh, the regular Song of Ice and Fire series, that we get a lot of information from the world of Ice and Fire and Fire and Blood. Would you agree? We do, we do, and we get a different perspective on it um, than we perhaps did previously. Now, part of this is because this is written by Archbishop Gildane, who's quite biased, uh, but also we see things in more detail than we did before. There's a fantastic, just while I'm thinking of House Hightower, one of the little details in Fire and Blood I loved was when uh, one, it might have been Lionel Lannister, one of the old Lannister lords, um, was plotting to see whether he could get some dragon eggs and he thought if i can get some dragons then maybe i will be uh, i'll be able to make house lannister as powerful as the three most powerful families in the land which are house baratheon house velaryon and house hightower and it's like well if you'd asked most show uh, watchers who the three most powerful families are they probably wouldn't have picked those three um but there's also there was the the thing that really struck me about fire and blood with a slightly different perspective was uh with the as it should be the targaryen family tree every single time there was a succession crisis every single time uh, went from one king to the next king um there was a debate a discussion sometimes a civil war about who should take over next they never got it right and that has to be a a massive clue to be what's going on. So when we see these debates in the show, as we surely will, whether John is the real ruler or should be the real ruler of Westeros or Danny, and in the books it's complicated by the addition of, uh, of Fagon or Aegon, uh, this is not new. This is par for the course for the Targaryens. They never know who should be in charge, and it's always the person who's got the most personal power who wins out, not who you think should be because they happen to be the eldest child or something like that. And male, right? Oh yeah. So, so the, <laughs> the other, th the, the other thing uh, with, with that is the amount and uh, keep on meaning to do a video on it and never quite get around to it. But we see that despite the fact that we just talk about the Targaryen Kings, actually the amount of times that women either actually ruled Westeros and never got the credit for it or should have ruled and um, some other male Targaryen just took it away from them is huge. You get uh, Arya Targaryen who was the one who flew off on Valerian and returned back with the really horrible little fireworms and all the rest of it. She was, um, she was heir to the throne under two different kings um uh, so uh, but she never succeeded to, to the throne mm -hmm. uh there we have a we had a queen who ruled in king's landing for uh six months but just got expunged from the record because her side happened to lose the civil war we we had uh queens who ruled uh for a year up to three years um as a sort of a regent so the the the, the figurehead might be the child uh, the real king, but the person actually ruling was their mother or their aunt. We have uh, the the original three Targaryens. Most of the time, actually, you find that Aegon wasn't in King's Landing. He was either in Dragonstone or wandering around the kingdom, visiting different places, at which time one of his sisters would be sitting in the Iron Throne and they would be ruling. So it's not just a history of Targaryen kings. The female Targaryens have got a hugely strong history, and they've just kind of been airbrushed out a little bit of the history that we've previously been told. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that George wanted to set straight because we get that feeling from uh, the previous books that there is only a, a an Aegon, you know, a Viserya, and uh, very few of the females um, that have come through, and, and it's probably a bigger story with the benefit of fire and blood than, than we ever could have thought of, to be honest with you. I really enjoyed that. Um, I wanted to tie some of the Traveler's Guide together in that the High Tower and the Eyrie, both are super tall structures. Um, yeah. The wall is a super tall structure, and we've often thought of it as a fence, 
you know, uh, you on this side, me on that side. That's what its purpose is. But have you ever thought of, because of the extreme height of these buildings and structures, that it's to keep you off the ground and not necessarily um, all, uh, away from each other, if that makes any sense? It it does. I think um, one of the things you, know, you were asking about what kind of struck me, one of the things that was very apparent to me when I was going through it was the amount of structures that were inside the ground built into hills and the like. And this is so this is the a link across to what you were talking about. So you get the high tower. We think of the tower, but actually at its base, there's this kind of like uh, um, black rock substance that appears quite a lot of the time that, that's there, that's almost built into the rock. And then you get castle rock. It's not a castle on top of a rock. It's the castle is inside the rock. Um, you go to the wall and you find that a lot of what their, their buildings, their structures are actually underground. Mole Town is called Mole Town. If you remember Mole Town from... The, Sure. early series uh that's called mole town because three quarters of it is underneath the ground it's like moles a mole town um okay. and, and this idea exactly and and Connected. uh so this is repeated all throughout you get you get house fowler and dawn are the same you have um uh when you're looking at the eerie a lot of that is dug into the um uh the 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 mountain, uh, as, as it were, the giant's lance. Um, you get, uh, obviously, Winterfell. You get the crypts dug into the ground. Everywhere you go, there's stuff dug into the ground, and there seems to be more happening underground and in the ground than any, anywhere else. But you, you were talking in particular about, like, the high places. They are definitely there as a kind of, like, a, a distancing from whoever else is around. And the it's... There is a sort of an, an othering thing that's going on here, pun sort of intended, but it's like uh, with the wall, it's that we're on this side and then whoever's on the other side, they're, they're not us. And so it was initially about the others, but then the wildlings got viewed in the same way because they happen to be on the other side of the wall. And similarly, when you are up in a high place like the area, you can look down on everything else and you can feel superior. So there's a huge amount of this kind of us and them, which is endemic within that kind of feudalistic society anyway, but it's been, uh, it's been shown to the max by George R. R. Martin in the, the things that he has created in that world. I I, that was a very long, long answer, and I totally <laughs> appreciate the amount of detail that you put in there. Um, my question is, what are they, what are they trying to stay away from, if the height is really the issue? If I could, if I could, put yeah. It so. Um... I, I think that is your very polite way of saying that was, that was a really long answer that didn't actually answer the question I, I, I was I asking. No, 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 no. You <laughs> answered the question perfectly, and, and um, I'm not trying I, I to say think, that at all because I think the details that you put in were details I wasn't prepared to talk about, um, not because I, I didn't appreciate them, but it, I really want to find out if you think that they are trying to stay above something as opposed to, you know, because of those things that you mentioned. Or is it just the fact that this is the best way to utilize the natural structure? I think it's mostly the latter, to be honest. I think that's what it is. But there is a sense of um, building the big and impressive thing, thinking that that is really important and will protect you, and it doesn't. There is a huge amount of hubris going on here. So... Uh, the big example is Harren Hall. If you ever read the descriptions of it, it's like seven times the size of Winterfell. It's got a, um, it's got a godswood. You know, the Harren, Harren the Black didn't even worship the old gods, but it's got a godswood many times the size of Winterfell's as well. It's got taller walls than anywhere else. Um, a huge everything is is there. It had a great hall with thirty five different um, fireplaces, and and it was just huge 
And then the day it was officially opened was the day the dragons arrived. And, and from that moment on, it was just toast. Um, and I think it's the same with the wall is that I said it started off being quite low. That's because the actual, the protection for humans was the magic in it, not the physical barrier. But the humans of the wall, the Night's Watch, they built up the physical barrier, thinking this would offer them protection from something. And it it doesn't. It made absolutely no difference. And as we saw on the show, it, the height of the wall made no difference whatsoever. So that, that for me is the message that George R. R. Martin is giving us, is that actually all your human endeavour to try and create um, some kind of hugely powerful thing to protect you against whatever other things are out there, actually it's unfounded and it's not going to help. Not going to help us at all if we are attacked by uh, non-stoppable dead beings, right? That can't be killed. Oh, exactly, yeah. So, And, and I mean, the, the, the wall in many ways is, is a nonsense because you can just walk around it on the western side anyway. <laughs> I think that's a, a point that we gloss over so quickly we, 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 we do far, we do far too often with the uh, with the wall is that it stops at the water and at the other end it stops at a canyon and the, what the wildlings do is they just walk down along the canyon and then come up the other side so it's um yeah it's not the world it's well it's it shows that uh, what they thought was defending them was not the actual wall itself but where the line was uh, another great uh, narrator in the chat, Frank Markopoulos, if you ever get a chance to check his channel out, full of great narrations. Chrissy of Oldstones also does uh, narrations that are really fantastic. I love uh, listening to both of you guys, so thanks for being here. Robert has one of those voices, though, that is um, just absolutely mesmerizing, and uh, his channel, The Well-Told Tale, has another... Uh, library of great narrations. I look forward to seeing what, what's next. Uh, do you have anything on the horizon? Yeah, I'm. Well, I'm about to ask my patrons what I should do for during season eight of Game of Thrones because what I want is a book that I can just read through from beginning to end. I've got I've got quite a few things that I've been thinking about. Um, I got some pe people seem to really appreciate the HP Lovecraft, so I want to do a bit more on that some point i'm definitely going to do dracula um that's a story that's so fantastic that i definitely want to get to it um and i have a hankering to do the picture of dorian gray which is uh, the only novel oscar wilde ever wrote um and it's a fantastic story so uh, got a lot of things just on the horizon that i i'd quite like to do and i've got a sort of, I, i've got a longer term plan with that as well i should as as we have the time. Uh, I think that uh, what I love at the moment is introducing people to these classic stories, the stories that are the absolute staples of not just science fiction and fantasy, but, but world literature. And I want to start mixing that up with newer stories as well. Now that obviously costs money, so I'm building up, trying to build up a war chest for that so that I can then start buying rights to be doing some of the newer stories. But I would love to start doing some of the award-winning uh, short stories over the last few years that, that win the World Fantasy Award and the Hugo Award and things like that. I'd love to be able to start narrating some of them on the, the channel as well. So, so that's where I'm wanting to go. I'm wanting to keep up with the absolute classics, but also have some modern day classics too. Yeah, there is a, a real issue in regards to what you can read on YouTube, correct? You can't just read Game of Thrones, or a Song of Ice and Fire series and monetize it and that sort of well, thing, correct? Yeah, yeah ex exactly. So, I mean, I, I do get asked this question quite a few times, actually, is so um, it's every country's sort of fair use under copyright is slightly different. The, the ethos is the same. If you're just quoting something and you say, and you do your quotion and you say, this is from, by George R. R. Martin from this section of the book, then that's absolutely fine. It's it's the same as if you were writing an essay back at school and you are quoting somebody and you just put your, uh, your little reference and nobody's got any problem with that. The moment that you start um, passing over that line to just make money out of somebody else's work, something that they have put their hard work and effort into, that rightly is not fair and that's going against copyright so i could not for example um 
just start narrating uh, A Song of Ice and Fire because quite rightly, the royalties for that should be going to George R.R. R. Martin, not to me. And he's agreed deals with people to be reading his audiobooks, and and that's that's the the way that the world has to work. So, um, but my way around this is that if you can buy those rights, which is where I'm aiming to get to in the next six months to a year, then I can start bringing some of the the newer stuff as well. Nice. Uh, Linda R. asks, can you narrate in Audible? And I think we've talked about that, the ACX option. Yes, absolutely. So it's it's entirely possible to. I have investigated it. I think for the moment, my plan is to just do my own narrations. Uh, I choose. I, I, I really enjoy being in charge of choosing what it is that I read um, and uh, doing it in the way and the style that I want rather than um, doing it uh, via creative. a company. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I've got I, I've got a lot of time for Audible. I think they do some mm -hmm. fantastic things. Uh, they've got some excellent narrators. And maybe at some point I will go over and do some work for them. But for the time being, uh, The Well-Told Tale is a passion project for me. It's a thing that I love doing myself. Um, what I will do as well at some point is I'll, I'll start bundling up those stories that I've did. So for example, uh, Frankenstein had, I can't remember, seven, eight different parts to it. Um, I would do them. I do them long form. So it's it's normally averaging about three quarters of an hour per episode, no adverts in the middle, kind of breaking it up. Um, but I, at some point I will stitch together all of those parts and then I will re um, uh, uh, release that, my version of Frankenstein, which is out of copyright, obviously, uh, which is uh, so it's completely uh, fine, and I will re release that as a full audio book um, uh, over on Amazon and all the usual places. True enough. Uh, speaking of which, and I didn't really ask you about this before, but can you talk about a little bit um, in regard to the Article 13 that's coming around that uh, really affects um, a, a lot of creators from uh, the United Kingdom and Europe? <laughs> Yes, I can. Um, the Well, the, the first thing I should say is that this is moving quite quickly. So if you're watching this live, this is up to date. Um, uh, if you're watching this a bit later, then it may well be out of date by then. Uh, and secondly, um, uh, I although I'm, I'm an interested layman with the, with some expertise in these areas uh, I'm by, by no means a legal professional so uh, if, if don't, don't take my word for it this is just my interpretation but the that's all we can ask by the way <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so but for those who've no idea what article 13 is this is a bit of an EU legislation that they're trying to bring in at the moment and the idea it's a sort of a technical change um, uh, that has some quite big ramifications, which is that they are changing who has the um, the responsibility or who bears the potential liability of any copyright claims on places like YouTube. At the moment, it is on the creators, so it is on me or it is on AU, um, but they wish to change it so that it is actually the platform who has that liability. Now, that may, might sound like quite a technical change, but that, what that means is that YouTube suddenly are faced with the fact that they've got, I've no idea how many channels, hundreds of thousands of these channels. Millions, right? Millions, of, millions yeah. of hours of new material all the time. Um, they are suddenly liable for absolutely everything that's on there. And if some, and if at some random person uploads something uh, and, and the, they get sued, then it's... YouTube who are liable for it. Now, they obviously say, well, this is going to be really tough on them. So they have had to say, we will have to take some drastic action if that's, if that's what happens. And so what they're, what they're, they haven't spelled out exactly what it is, but they've, they've been muttering, this is the CEO of, of YouTube has been mut muttering darkly about having to close down effectively uh, huge amounts of channels based in Europe, um, of having to have really stringent upload filters, which make it really hard for people to upload stuff in the first place, and taking down huge amounts of back catalogue of old videos that are there already, because they have to have a zero risk approach to this. If there's anything that they're not, that they, that they do not know, 
whether or not it's um, they are potentially liable for it, then they are going to err on the side of caution. So this has got particularly in Europe, quite uh, potentially apocalyptic implications for creators. Um, uh, as far as creators outside of Europe, it will also have an impact because it means that they will um, just not show your videos in Europe. Uh, and this will therefore impact on how much stuff uh, you will, you know, it, the income of YouTube creators and, and the, the, the reach of YouTube creators. Um, but that's where we're at. The, the situation is that it is actually going to have a final vote this week coming up. Uh, I don't know the exact date, but it's some point the, during this week. So fingers crossed it won't actually get put forward. Um, but uh, if it is adopted, then the EU being a slightly bureaucratic place, it, is, it doesn't immediately take effect. Each national government then has got two years to enact that within their own uh, laws of their country. And YouTube will, at that point, start working out what they're going to do. And their first instinct will be to protect their own back, which I completely understand. Um, but that's the that's situation. An interesting, that's an interesting point that uh, you've, you're given that two year time period. Um, I, I didn't know that that was uh, a fact. Well, so it's because the EU is different to the USA, which is the USA mm -hmm. is a country. Uh, in and whereas you've got states which govern stuff, if if your um, if your federal government makes a law, it's the law. Right. Um, but uh, in the EU, the EU is not a country. It is still, although it's moving more in that direction, it's still a, effectively a, a federation of lots of individual sovereign nations. And so the, the galactic empire. Sorry. Effectively, the, the, the <laughs> sovereign nations have all agreed if the EU parliament create this legislation, we will enact it. And they, everyone signed up to the fact that it's going to happen, but uh, they have to actually physically do it themselves. So there's a period to allow, you know, because some countries will be having an election or some other countries might have particularly slow legislature or, uh, or, or whatever. So it's uh, th there's, there's this period where some countries will be bringing in over time. The reason why I bring this up is because we have a lot of great creators that we follow that are in the UK. And, and if I understand it correctly, it just means that what you put out on YouTube has to be your material. You can't have, you know, a picture of something on your YouTube channel or a video clip or an audio clip of something that isn't owned by you. And then you present it as, as you know, even if it's uh, fair use as we call it, um, it's still not able to be used. Is that your understanding? Well, this is where the, the problem comes because the, the, the copyright rules, fair use has not changed. So that's, that's staying exactly the same. Uh, so, for example, I would still be able to, as I do, upload videos which have pictures from Game of Thrones, still pictures, because under fair use, I am critiquing them, I am commenting on them, I, uh, I am changing their original usage uh, for a different artistic purpose. That the language is something along those lines. But so, so that is still completely legal. But YouTube obviously don't have actual human beings looking at every single video to to check whether or not this is right. And everybody who does the kind of things that I do, there are a whole lot of other people, not within this community necessarily, but sort of wider, who would upload something just with a, a song as the background or they, a, a couple of minutes worth of video from some TV show they like or something like that. And that probably would cross over the line. That would probably be actually against copyright rules and against fair use. Uh, but the the way YouTube have to do this is by setting up effectively this kind of um, uh, firewall algorithm that looks at stuff before it goes up. And mm -hmm. those of us who have been creators in the community for a while have known the issues with demonetization. It's all the same kind of idea there that, that uh, the, the system looks at it and says, well, I'm not sure whether this is this is right and fair. I'm going to demonetize that so you can't make any money from it. 
But it's going to be like that, but just so much more extreme because they're just going to completely cover their backs. So that's what the issue is. It's this. Uh, it's the upload filters that they that they are going to be effectively forced by legislation to put in place will prevent uh, lots and lots of videos from being uploaded that actually are completely legal, but they they can't take any chances. Makes sense. Not to thank you very much for that information. That's totally off topic, and um, but it is, like I said, critical to a lot of us that are fans of yours and and other creators that are in the UK. So thank you for explaining that, as as to your understanding. So no liability. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no liability here. As I say, I gave my disclaimer at the start. I'll give it at the end. I'm, uh, that's that's my interpretation of it. If go, go to a lawyer if you want a, an actual one. Nice. So uh, back to questions, if I could, Living on a Prayer asks, do you think the White Walkers are the original people of Westeros before the Children of the Forest and the Giants? Um, no, I think <laughs> the uh, my... That was a gentle no. It, it was because I was <laughs> just trying to weigh it up. Um, the The identity and the motivations beyond the behind the white walkers is clearly in my mind the big reveal that we still have to get uh, in the show um the explanation that we got on the show to me makes complete sense that these uh that the first one or and probably all of them were from the first men um uh, and they were created by the children of the forest as a perfect weapon against humanity. And I think that the, the evidence for that is not just uh, that scene in the show, uh, but also if you were to create uh, a perfect weapon against humanity, uh, you have to remember the children of the forest are very small. They, they didn't have the same technology as humans. They didn't have the same number of people as humans and they weren't um, having new babies as often as humans. So everything was stacked in favor of the humans. Um, and so what they did was they created, if you imagine this kind of perfect thing, they said, well, we want somebody that's as strong as humans or stronger, uh, that actually can use humans' um, uh, strengths, uh, strength of numbers against them so that they can actually turn humans against themselves effectively. We want them to be resistant to the things that humans usually use for their weapons, so a normal sword will just bounce off of it. Um, we want it to be... Uh, resistant to fire you can certainly see that the white walkers on the show seem to just sort of walk through fire without thinking about it too much um but we also want them to have this kind of like um uh, in case it all goes wrong we want them to be vulnerable to the weapons that we use which is dragon glass weapons so i think that that if you were to design the perfect thing to be attacking humanity to be protecting yourself as you might see it against humanity then that's exactly what you do so now i think that they were from the first men and i think that um we've we've kind of seen that um in the show not just in that scene but also in the, the sort of the turning of the children when craster's baby was taken up and, and turned that wasn't just creating a random baby white um that was creating a new white walker Wow, that was a that was a great answer. <laughs> Thanks. I think that these things far more than I should. I think that it's um, amazing how gentle the no was, and then how long the explanation of <laughs> why I just slapped you down. Um, but no, that's a living on a prayer. That's a great question because we know that the creation story is a lie, so we do have to speculate as to what really happened, um, especially with the fact that. These giants are so big, they don't use weapons as as we know them. And uh, they've been around forever. They, you know, they fished in the rills, which is right by Winterfell. Um, there's, there's all kinds of um, creatures like that that are around not too distant uh, past. Um, and so when we hear the stories, we just have to speculate because there's no other, there's no other information that is uh, reliable, I guess, is the best way to put it. Would you say that's true, Robert? It is, and the the reliable evidence that we have is actually from the Weirwoods, 
is is that's the only thing that we can really go by because this was the the ancient history we don't have stuff written down there this was all just stuff passed down uh, by way of stories so we can't take them completely seriously old man stories some of them seem very true some of them actually are clearly completely made up um but uh, so we can't take the stories as being exactly true. And George R. R. Martin's told us again and again, these are like myths, these are like legends. There's some kernel of truth in these stories, but we shouldn't take them literally uh, to be true. And, but the Weirwoods have got the collected memories of all of the, um, the people who have been sacrificed into them and you can go through them and see through them in the way that Bran does. And so when he's going through he is seeing things that actually happen. So actually through the Weirwood Network is the way to get the answers for this. That's interesting that you should say that because I just had a science fiction fan, uh, movie creator, uh, Axel Foley uh, from the DVR podcast, who is, uh, I mentioned to him that I don't believe the Weirwoods. As a matter of fact, when I think Bran touches the Weirwoods, it's kind of like, and you would know this from your Westworld uh, research and, and videos, when you go into the array, uh, it's basically a fictional area. Um, and I think it's similar to that, or the holodeck on Star Trek. When you are, are in there, you're getting fed what the children want you to believe. And it's based on the fact that they have put in their memories of what people have believed. Like, for example, the Tower of Joy scene, we hear Ned talk about it. That's his belief. He put, you know, his thoughts into the weirwood, and that's how we got that particular story. Does that make sense? It does. Um, I mean, I think, I think there's a difference between the show and the book. They're quite often on these kind of matters of detail and nuance. Um, in the books it seems very clear that um the weirwoods you can see through the weirwoods at different points in time and uh interact with what's around you because the weirwoods that the weirwoods themselves are neutral what they are experiencing is just this kind of data bank of experiences so what bran is seeing and experiencing through them is what was actually happening it's not just a person's perspective on what was that what was happening it does seem to be that he can actually see and experience but this is the difference between the the two types of history that we've got going on here we've got the the written maester's history that we with our kind of like modern western mind thinks that's what real history is but we always have an asterisk next to that because it's um it's more uh archmaester gildane is biased and sure. we know that so so we shouldn't take that as actual fact history the other kind of history is this kind of experiential history where it's not somebody interpreting it it's just showing the events and so i think it's what that means is that you only get one bit of what was going on. You don't get to see all of the ins and outs. You don't get to understand what people's motivations were. You don't get to see what happened just before or just afterwards. You just happen to come in there and see that particular thing. So it is, it's also a biased form of history, but it's a, a true form of history. You, you're seeing it you're experiencing it, but that doesn't mean that you've got a full understanding of exactly what was going on. Can you give me a, um, evidence for that, I guess is the best way to put it, because I'm getting the impression that we have to interpret a lot of this story as far as what is true and what is not true. And even with the creation of the Night King, we are told that that's possibly not even the truth. So I'm trying to figure out what it is that you're using as a as a foundation for that statement. Um, the internal cohesion of the story is what I'm trying to use, um, by which just to use, uh, and I had a fantastic discussion with Gemma from Secrets of the Citadel on my channel uh, a few weeks ago about this, actually. Um, if you take um, what Bran is doing, he 
affects history. Uh, you see it, first of all, at the Tower of Joy, he calls out, Ned turns around, that created a sort of a closed loop. Ned always turned around because he heard something, but the thing he heard was Bran, who always went back. Uh, so there's a sort of a very clever tense, everything that uh, had happened had had happened, or had, would have happened, uh, and so that creates this kind of closed loop that Ned always had looked around. Bran was just going back to fulfil that, to make that happen in the past. In the same way that on with Hodor, Hodor was always destined to be holding the door. That's the whole point about it. All the way through the story for those uh, those five, six seasons, whatever it was, until the big reveal, he was Hodor. And he was as he was because of something that was going to happen in the future. And that thing that was going to happen in the future was actually aff affected by Bran going back into the past. So he has created this closed loop and he is affecting things that are actually there. If Bran going back in either of those instances was just going back to see some kind of holodeck made up thing that wasn't there, that would not, Ned would not have turned around. Hodor would not have been Hodor. Bran is unless, affecting things. Unless Bran was warging Hodor at the time. He was, and he was doing it in the past, as, uh, which was where the closed loop happened. So he was, uh, that's, he was affecting the past, is the point, by yeah. his actions. So the moment we accept the fact that Bran affects the past, in his actions, we have to accept that the past he is seeing is true past. It's actual past. It's it's not just a made up story. Uh, they weren't just showing him. Here's here's a pretty picture of what Winterfell must have looked like before your birth. He was actually seeing and experiencing, and was actually there at Winterfell long before he was born. It's funny you should use that example because that's exactly one of the things that I think they used on blood raven to keep him there as a three-eyed raven and stay in the tree is the um attraction of the home like they used with bran at winterfell um, and that's why he stayed there too long where he couldn't actually leave um and that's one of the things i think they were trying to do with bran um uh, oh yeah don't get me wrong i'm not i'm not here defending the children of the forest the children oh, no, of the no, forest I, yeah uh, they, they are um, they are incredibly manipulative. You can see Blood Raven um, is uh, having been hooked up to the tree. He's not escaping now. He is being sucked up within the tree. Who he is, his personality, his knowledge, his experience, his brilliance is being sucked up into the tree. Um, and that is what, in theory, was what was going to happen to Bran. And we see it on the show when he's there and, you know, I'm not Bran anymore. Um, I'm the three-eyed raven. That is that is what is happening to him. So it's not that they're doing any kind of great um, uh, work. What they are, tr one way of looking at it perhaps is they are taking Bran and as they did Blood Raven and converting them to their side. They are making them part of the Weirwood network, mm -hmm. and therefore they are doing. They are showing them the truth and actually sucking them in through that uh, there is no motivation for them to be showing them some made up history about what might have happened uh in winterfell in in the past or what might have happened at the tower of joy in the past they they can show him the truth that's absolutely fine because he is being turned into one of them effectively one of their team a servant if you will well that may well be whether they see it or <laughs> Yeah, it's more uh, assimilated. Let, let's if if we're going sort of Star Trekky now, more assimilated into the Borg is probably a right. slightly more uh, a, a better way of seeing it. Being taken into the hive mind is is, is where he is going. Yeah, I um, have always thought that they there there was a definite disconnection between the truth and what the way George writes it, um, whether it be something obvious like Cersei teaching Joffrey how to tell stories to benefit himself um, or, uh, you know, Ned being the truthful person that has these deep buried lies. 
um, there's always the the interpretation, I guess, is the best way to put it. And um, when it comes to the children of the forest, I'm always cautious um, about their abilities, especially with the you know the the uh, hammer of the waters and the making of the Night King, and again these stories that we get through the Weirwoods, um, through the help of Blood Raven. Uh, so many great questions. I, I really want to thank everybody for being here. You guys have been awesome with these, um, the, the questions that uh, Robert has been patiently answering. And I, I just love this uh, conversation, but I definitely want to keep uh, Robert to our time frame as well, because uh, as you know, it's much later in the UK than it is uh, here in the Pacific uh, Northwest of the United States. It is, um, but it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. There, I, I've seen there have been some fantastic questions going through. I'm, I'm here as long as you want me. <laughs> Don't or until I fall asleep on my computer. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have those uh, QWERTY uh, keyboard letters on your face. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would keep you here forever if I could. But uh, um, I do want to ask you what it is that you really want to see in Season 8. I want to see a motivation for the White Walkers. That's that's the 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 big thing that I want. I if that happens, then I'm going to be happy because otherwise it's just here's a big baddie attacking for no reason, and that that does not feel like Game of Thrones or a Song of Ice and Fire to me. That just seems far too simplistic. I don't want it just to be a big battle and the good guys win and the bad guys lose and and that's it. I I want there to be a reason. For the white walkers to be doing what they're doing i would say that i don't want it to be a repeat of the return of the king and the two towers put together uh with the stories of helm's deep and uh and and orthanc and uh ministereth and that sort of thing i want it to be a, a true a true original story I yeah absolutely I, I i agree with you completely and what i need just to build on what i was saying uh, just then what I would love is for the the conclusion of this, uh, for the resolution of of all of this, not to be a battle. I th I think that it, yes, we can have big battles and and epic warfare and all the rest of it, but I just I do not want it just to be whoever you know the 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 good guys won because they they happen to be better at fighting. That just doesn't. It doesn't sit right with me as a George R. R. Martin story. I think that there has to be another layer to this, um, uh, and and I would love there to be uh, yes, big battles, but then a revelation about what it was that the White Walkers want, and some kind of clever way for it to be resolved that isn't just well, let's kill them all. <laughs> that would be that would be so unoriginal. Um... It, it would, and and the, it's it isn't unoriginal as a story, and so that's I want the ending to live up to it. Exactly, I do think that uh, you know Dan and Dave have gone through so much in the last ten years in regards to getting this information from George, especially since the books haven't been finished. Um, are you one of the the um, basically the on the camp of Dan and Dave have done a great job or have you been able to objectively look at their uh, storytelling ad adaptation? Uh, both. Um, I think where I will begin and end this mini rant is by saying that Game of Thrones is my favorite show on TV and is one of the finest things that TV has ever produced. Everything I say has to be within that, um, that, that kind of world. The, the the first four or five seasons, in my view, were a literary adaptation. They, particularly season one, um, almost scene for scene, dialogue for dialogue. Yes, there were a few little tweaks here to make it fit onto a TV screen and all the rest of it. But it was just, it was taking the book and it was putting it onto the screen. And that was a, it worked fantastically well. Towards the the second half of the, the run, uh, particularly last season, but also a couple of seasons before that, uh, it, as the, the books aren't there, it has changed to be a TV show inspired by 
the works of George R. R. Martin. Now, I don't, when I say that, that some people immediately think that this is me trying to do it down in some way, I think that there are good sides and there are bad sides to this. Um, the bad side is that uh, there have been a few little logical inconsistencies. The um, uh, the language, the dialogue hasn't been as good or as sharp. Some of the characterization hasn't. And I think I understand that completely because they've not got the original material to work from. But that is a downside. And I think we have to recognize it. But on the upside, the the TV show, once they accepted the fact that this is a TV show, they could use all of the magnificent um, skills, resources. resources that they can have to make a visual spectacle and and i mean partly things like the battle of the bastards which i thought was astonishingly visceral um uh, the way that they got down at eye level and showed just that the randomness and horror of war was was pretty astonishing but also um uh, the next episode when you got the uh, Circe uh, and the, the the blowing up of the great sept of Baylor. If you just picture it now, that that long build up when you get the magnificent music in the background, and then you just get this shot. They didn't even need dialogue, pretty much. They just showed Circe there drinking the wine. Um, they had Tommen, who was trying to go down there, stopped by the mountain. You can see Marjorie slowly figuring out something was going along. You get the crawling up to try and stop the candle before it burns on the wild. That, the, that was so good in terms of TV, that slow build-up uh, and the payoff was astonishing. And so when they do good TV, they do brilliant TV. So it's... Uh, I've shifted my view from this is a literary adaptation to this is a TV uh, series inspired by the works of George R. R. Martin. And that has good sides and that has bad sides. And that's, that's, that's where I'm at. And, and I said I would end where I started, which is Game of Thrones is still my favourite thing on TV. And I think as a whole, we'll look back on it in years to come and say that was some of the finest TV that, that has been produced. I couldn't agree with you more. I think that... Um... Your answer is better than anything I could have said, for sure. <laughs> um, this is one of the things that we have a hard time with, is realizing the enormity of what they've accomplished. And um, I think, you know, four different film sets all over the world and uh, hundreds of actors, characters that we've fallen in love with because of the great casting. Costuming is amazing. Um, the storyline is unfinished, so they have to do something. Um, and I think they did make some mistakes, but yeah, we do have to move on. And I am so excited. I, I don't know about you, but on an anticipation level, I'm at about a hundred. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I've really wanted like season two for Westworld to be at the same level, but, uh, I, even that show has been disappointing compared to, uh, Game of Thrones. So. Well, I'll tell you the one thing that I'm most excited about season uh, eight of Game of Thrones is the fact that one lesson they learned from Westworld, I'm pretty sure that they did this deliberately, was that the Westworld season two trailer was all about the first half of the season, which meant that people like me, AU, who could unpick the trailers, we could figure out a lot of what was going to happen in the first half of the season. The second half of the season, complete surprise. No idea where it was going to go. And that's exactly the same that they've done here for this trailer for Game of Thrones season eight. The vast majority of the, 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 the footage that we've got, if not all of it, we don't know yet, but surely the vast majority of it is in episodes one to three. They have shown us almost nothing, if not nothing, of the final three episodes. And I am so, so wanting that we don't get any huge leaks about it because the 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 prospect of going into that not knowing at all what's going to happen at the end of this epic uh, series is just, I, I love it. I couldn't agree with you more. I'll just say ditto, as they say. <laughs> 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 well, I hope you guys have enjoyed this as much as I have, because I think uh, Robert is one of the kindest gentlemen. Uh, he definitely spends so much time uh, with other creators and also um, making sure that the content that he does produce is the, is quality. And um, I really do like that. Uh, I hope that we get more and more from you as years to come.
Well, you're you're very kind. It's uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I uh, I advertise this on Twitter as as I'm I'm going to go and live stream with the nicest man on YouTube, and uh, <laughs> I, I, I I hold to that. Uh, a you you are you are an everyone's favourite YouTube uncle. You're you're such a delight to work with. Um, uh, and it's as I say, it's an absolute pleasure. So very happy to come on at any other time. Nice, nice. I I hope that uh, after the season is over, when everybody is. Uh, taking a shower and stop sweating so much and, and all the excitement is over uh, that we'll get to do this again and do a review. Yeah, I'd love that. Awesome. Well, again, thanks for everybody in the chat. I really do appreciate it. Make sure you go to the description, check out Robert's uh, information. Everything is there. Uh, I literally just copied and pasted everything from his about section. So all of the links from his single, you know, first and second channel, his Patreon channel, um, is a Patreon page, I should say. All of that information is there. So uh, definitely take a look at that. If you haven't subscribed to him, what the hell are you doing? Go, do it now. <laughs> um, but seriously, folks, uh, quality creator, definitely enjoy uh, everything that you do. So um, thanks for being here. And thanks for staying up so late. And uh, I'm really glad that you're back from vacation, all rested and ready to go. Um, absolutely loving it. And if you do go over to my channel, then uh, I should have had, I, I scheduled it to go a new video just going live um, uh, today. So pretty much as we went on air here, I've not had a chance to have a look at that. So uh, uh, hopefully it did go up. Nice. What, what do you have coming up? If you don't mind me asking, do you have another collab or um, another video yeah, besides well, the one today? Lots. Um, so obviously I've got the season eight. Uh, what I'm going to be doing during season eight, I have uh, I think I put it on Twitter, but I'm going to sort of publish it elsewhere as well. Uh, my schedule for season eight, I'm going to try and put a huge amount of effort into it. I'm going to be doing two live streams a week, one of them uh, before the show. So it's a pre-show one uh, that'll be coming on at... Um, five o'clock Eastern Standard Time every Sunday. Um, then uh, that will be with a special guest each week. Uh, we'll look back at, the, back at the previous episode and we'll look forward to the next episode. Then there's, I'm going to do an episode breakdown within 24 hours of each episode, an episode breakdown, I'm going to do a breakdown of the trailer and then take a feel for what are the questions that people are asking. There's always stuff that people are talking about after every episode of Game of Thrones, and I'll try and do a couple of reactive videos as well. And as always, my usual Thursday live streams, if you don't know, I live stream every Thursday uh, at six o'clock uh, Eastern Standard Time. Um, and that's just me. Sometimes it's just me. Sometimes I have on a guest, um, uh, but I'll be doing that one uh, all the way through the season as well. So I've got all of that. I've got a my traveler's guide is carrying on i've been doing a series of collaborations with Gemma from secrets of the citadel looking at some of the more interesting houses like house hightower house dane house reed we've been going through them just doing an uh, analysis of them and i'm going to do a few character breakdowns as well in the build up to season eight coming up so i've got I think I'm going to do a few of the Starks, Sansa Stark and all the rest of it mm -hmm. and finally uh, this is a long list of things uh People keep on asking me, so I am going to say, yes, I am very nearly at the point of my series about Robert's Rebellion and the Tower of Joy when I'm going to tackle what actually happened at the Tower of Joy. I am now writing the video, uh, which is going to be titled something like, How on Earth Did Ned Know to Go There? Um, uh, so there's that. And then there's I think you should what? call it Arthur Dane is Mance Raider. That's what I think you should call it. <laughs> <laughs> Confirmed. You heard it here first, folks. <laughs> Uh, that's an that's an amazing list. That's awesome. I'm really looking forward to that that much content. That's uh, a lot of great stuff. So very well, cool. Well, set, set my bar high, and that means that I will fail spectacularly. <laughs> Trust me, I know that feeling. I've been there. Um, folks, uh, stay tuned uh, for this particular channel because we still have uh, Kevin from the Bats Production, John Del Vento, who's a composer, music composer. Angelina High, Gray Area is coming, as well as Claire Gray and Catherine Cronall. So make sure you stay tuned. Uh, I also have on the 6th, uh, Warrior King Productions, a movie producer coming on. So that's going to be on the 6th of April. And then uh, we still have uh, Khaleesi Clues that hasn't been able to, to make time for us yet, but we'll get, we'll get her on. And uh, so many more. 
very excited for season eight. And thank you so much for being here. You guys have a great day and uh, we'll check out again tomorrow. Take care.